Whatever you do, don't call her babe. I'm John Renton with the retro view of Barbed Wire, regarded as one of the worst movies of the 1990s, starring Pamela Anderson in all her big-titted blonde glory, in all her fun and fancy-free and big-titted glory. In all honesty, really, 15-year-old me absolutely wanted to see this movie, and admittedly it was fun back then, but even the 15-year-old, you know, that loved Pamela Anderson had to admit this movie wasn't very good. It had a bald Udo Kier in it. Bald Udo Kier is somehow more frightening than regular Udo Kier. I've said Udo Kier so much, it has lost all meaning. This is from director David Hogan, who only did one other theatrically released movie. Most Wanted, with Keenan Ivory Wayans and the human lizard himself, John Voight. That's when he looked like a human lizard, when he was thrown up by an anaconda, if only it was for real, because if you look at John Voight, and why would you want to, you realize that the guy was always a piece of shit and then developed even into more of a piece of shit during the last number of years. But anyway, David Hogan also did a bunch of music videos, including Sheryl Crow's All I Wanna Do Is... I'm not gonna actually use the interpretation that I would have out of that, but nevertheless, yeah, barbed wire. It's set in the futuristic year of the now-not-future 2017. And, well, let's just say America's kind of fucked. It's a dystopian future, and, you know, given what happened with the election around that time, for about four years, it almost felt like that at some points, didn't it? Granted, it wasn't this bad, because this future actually was somehow less depressing. I kid, I kid, of course. They spent $9 million on this, and it was to give Pamela Anderson a big action role with big titted glory and leather and all that and her being husky and sexy at the time and all that and everything and you know Pamela Anderson should have been given more fun roles and she should have had more fun with this role or been allowed to have more fun with this role because this movie wasn't nearly as fun as it should have been. Take a look at the barbed wire graphic novel comic book whatever the hell you want to call it you could have had more fun with it, and this just played it safe, despite the fact that you got to see her boobies a few times. <laughs> Two people wrote this. Two people wrote a movie starring Pamela Anderson and featuring some of the goofiest, most ridiculous, futuristic stuff that you've seen uh, this side of, well, really any cheaply made direct-to-video movie. Irene Chaikin, who... Was uh, who helped create the L word? That was actually quite a good series, despite the fact it got really bonkers and liked to kill people off for no goddamn reason. But it was actually a pretty good representation of um, lesbian relationships. And then it got really weird, and the finale was very, very goddamn strange. But also Law and Order: Organized Crime. I forgot that show existed. <coughs> and Chuck Faffer, not uh, Fluffer, but Faffer. He did Dark Man. Yeah, the guy that wrote Dark Man actually had something to do with this. They took Dark literally because this movie at times was so goddamn dark you couldn't see what the hell was going on. Hard Target, Virus, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis um, on a ship that had some kind of electronic weirdness going on there. I should retroview Virus even though I hated it. And Red Planet. I remember Mission to Mars and Red Planet came out the same year just like Dante's Peak and Volcano and Armageddon and Deep Impact and... All that stuff. Yeah, they did two Mars movies. <clears throat> Red Planet somehow was the goofier of the two. And Mission to Mars was pretty goddamn goofy, despite being more subdued. Anyway, so yes, Pamela Anderson. Uh, Tamura Morrison, pretty certain I probably totally butchered that. He plays Axel. Not Axel Rose, because not every rose has a thorn. But a guy named Charlie, Jack Noseworthy, who ironically didn't have any eyes. I don't know how that's ironic. He looked more like Axl Rose than Axl Rose did. Victoria Roll, <clears throat> who plays Cora D, they want the Cora D. Well, the congressional, uh, dick, <clears throat> the congressional directorate. Yeah, that's how it's said. No wonder I couldn't figure out how to say it unless I referred to my goddamn nose. <clears throat> Xander Berkeley, the aforementioned Udo Kier. Clint Howard, look, Clint Howard, I'm sure, is a very, very nice man, but cosmetically pleasing is something he is not. Shelley, uh, to say who was doing his best Peter Lorre impression. Peter. He, he, he. If you're an MST3K fan, you're going to love that. John Paxson, believe it or not. And Tom Lister Jr. Yes, Tiny Lister. He was actually in this. Briefly. He was very briefly in this. You know, I'm going to be perfectly honest. This movie, 
wasn't meant to be good, and anybody going into this movie expecting it to be good, quite frankly, was doomed from the start. <laughs> they were going to be disappointed. But Tank Girl, this kind of reminded me of Tank Girl. Tank Girl had a little bit more fun with its premise, but this kind of falls in that same thing, where I think they tried to treat it too goddamn seriously, instead of being bonkers and ridiculous. And also, this is in the 90s when they were just doing anything. Hollywood was doing just anything to make a profit, and $9 million dollars for uh, the budget for this movie would be almost 18 million uh, according to the inflation calculator or just around that 17 and a half million something like that and yeah set in the not too distant past now of 2017 the second american civil war there's only one free city steel harbor heavy armor no steel harbor and somewhere in la or some harbor city because they're near wait for it a harbor i know shocking barbed wire pamela anderson just runs a bar and she has udo kier as her uh her her lone waiter and well i mean the basically her right hand man and then a bunch of sexy women all dressed and everything and she also is a spy that does bounty hunting stuff and gets people and then quotes weird quips and all this stuff and man this is just so bad the action scenes are ridiculous and pamela is never a great actress i just always felt like maybe got kind of a raw deal because they only saw her as just the baywatch beauty if she certainly was but the fact that this is probably the most memorable uh high profile movie role that she had that's not good I know she's been in other stuff. Um, she was in a recent horror movie that I watched where actually she wasn't all that bad. She played a sheriff. <clears throat> and that was fine for what it was. But <laughs> she's dancing for... She's dancing like pretending to be a dancer at this... Well, not pretending to be a dancer, but posing as somebody that works at this bar. And a guy calls her babe and she kills him with a heel. Don't call me babe. I hate when people call me babe. If one more person calls me babe... And then she's in with these other dancers, and this one uh, one dancer is speaking French, and this other one says she's Chinese. Wait, what? You know, it's just, the attempts at comedy just totally fail on this. And she manages to get, she manages to get this, this daughter that was kidnapped by the people who run the bar for some reason. They go down a, sh they go down a laundry chute. <laughs> she... She's got a grappling hook and says, what's that for? You ever seen Batman? Oh, let's reference better movies. Pretty bad that I think Batman and Robin actually was better than this. And that came out a year later. But then we get narration, almost like a film noir thing. This film uh, tries to pay homage to Casablanca with a couple things with like the cop and the noir <clears throat> things in a very, very bad way, by the way. You could have had the entire cast of Casablanca reprise their roles um, you know, in 1996, and it would have been a lot better than this, and I think pretty much all of them were dead by that point. I, I, I know Bogart was. I'm pretty certain everybody that worked on the Casablanca set, if not dead, they were pretty much just, um, you know, about dead by 1996. So, she says, 2017, the worst year of my life, <clears throat> and the not-too-distant future, 27 AD, it's a civil war, not too different from you, or, no, that doesn't really work. There's no Gizmonic Institutes, there's no man in a red jumpsuit, and there's nobody that got sent to space, and I just screwed up the song all over the place. So, yes, Cora D, played by Victoria, she basically <coughs> needs to be shipped to Canada. To The Canada seemingly is fine, despite the fact it was an unenforced border at this point. Somehow Canada's fine. If you get up there, you can find a way to stop this excuse me again, Congressional Directorate. Man, they made this shit too wordy. We got scrolling text, by the way, to start this movie. That's what, that's how you know your movie's really good, when you have scrolling fucking text. So, yeah. The police officers of the future absolutely suck, because they can't aim for goddamn shit. Clint Howard is a bail bondsman. You have the Cordy character in Axel. Axel, who has ties to barbed wire because they were on a mission and they fell in love and we find that out a little bit later um <laughs> her brother charlie is totally goddamn blind and just drinks constantly 
Then again, when you're blind and in a bar and you really don't have anywhere to go, what are you going to do? Probably drink. Don't necessarily blame him right there. Drink responsibly, by the way, folks. It's all grungy and leathery and ridiculous. She gets with this one guy uh, to get to this guy called Krebs. They call him Mr. Krebs. He has ties to, he, he's trying to be found by this Cora D and Axel character. Nobody knows what the hell is going on here. This guy dresses up in leather and then she takes his paddle and whacks him over the goddamn head. Again, you know, every red blood American boy would have absolutely loved to have been paddled by Pamela Anderson at that point. Boy, howdy. But then, she, for some reason she has all this stuff, like, all, all these like explosives and all these devices and everything. And she comes up with this plastic explosive foam stuff, whatever, and puts a mattress around this wall and then blows it up and our mattress prices are absolutely exploding out of the warehouse and then she gets they call him mr krebs and then she takes him to um clint howard schmidt's character there's a lot of stupid names here i just want to say both actors and characters and again i wrote down bald udo kier is off-putting for some reason is he still alive because he looked about 50 in this is he still alive? And I mean, I remember when he was in the Underworld movies, and I'm like, well, that's fitting. He looks like he's one of the undead. Poor Udo Kier. He has never done anything to deserve that. Or U Udo Kier. I don't actually know what his name is. Willis, not to be confused with Bruce Willis, who unfortunately <laughs> has dementia. That's very, very sad. One of the best action stars of the late 80s and into the 90s and even early 2000s. But Willis is a cop. He's a cop with an edge. And he's also maybe good, but maybe not, because he likes Bart, but he also needs to do what he wants because he's a liar and a thief, but he's an honest liar and a thief and all this. And they try to be noir and action-y and stupid and all that, and the movie never sets a tone. And then there's a resistant and a director and other buzzwords and futuristic phrases. I did like the scene where the uh, giant dog bit into a guy's balls to get him out of the uh, bar. That was actually kind of cool. And <clears throat> the it, and obviously they're going with this whole fascist thing for the directorate. But it's Hitler youth of the of the directorate. And then what ends up happening is they can't find Cordy. Despite the fact she's right there. She altered her appearance so she can't be seen the same. She basically just altered her hair. She had plastic surgery. Her hair is, seems to be the only difference as far as pictures and everything. But whatever, I digress. Axel and Barb end up getting together briefly. And then there's this leader of the resistance, Spike, who I swear I've seen in other movies, but I can't name right. I can't name her offhand. Or I can't, I can't name what offhand that is. She speaks with some kind of weird voice box thing. My name is Kane, and I am a Rudy Pooh candy ass. If anybody remembers that, I love you guys. And then Clint makes an offer for this particular item that he found on Mr. Krebs. It was these lenses, and if you put these lenses on, you can be, you can pass any of these retinal scans. That's the way that they're able to see now. You can change your face, you can change all that, but you can't change your eyes. So then we use these retinal scans, these giant virtual boy-like goggle things. I mean, seriously, look at those. How futuristic. And that's how they're going to get Cora D. Well, then the bar ends up getting blown up and a whole bunch of other shit happens. And all this weird shit. And this is right after Cora D explains, hey, Topeka, Kansas was the center of an epidemic. And that makes sense because not a lot of good stuff has come out of Kansas. I'm sorry to anybody from Kansas... Uh, that is watching this, you know, all five of you that happen to live in that state. I kid, I kid, of course. I know that Kansas is a lovely place. And, but, but Dorothy didn't even want to be in Kansas anymore. That's why she went to Oz. No, she said, I'm sorry. I was like, wait, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. That's what she said. She was weirdly weirded out by not being in Kansas. And then Barb... <laughs> Um, was going to take the dog with her because she decided, I'm going to go to this, I'm going to go to Canada. I'm going to help them get to Canada. This is actually, she talked to a guy named King Fatso that is literally so fat he has to be carried around in a payloader because comedy. It's like the fat guy from Blade, or the fat character from Blade. I forget the name, even though I retro-reviewed Blade. But... <laughs> 
She makes a deal with him. He's going to get her money. She's going to give him the lenses. Okay. And they get safe passage through these weird resistance areas with these weird guys that have toll booths spelled T-O-L-E. Because people of the future can spell. Kind of a metaphor for some people that voted for a certain somebody a few years ago. But then they decide we're going to get all our weapons together. Charlie, by the way, is also a complete idiot because at one point just before that, he ends up going completely blind to the Resistance headquarters that has been ransacked and besieged by this point, and now he's dead. So Barb decides she's going to leave, she's going to help Axel and Cordy, and then Willis suddenly shows up with all these cops because the King Paps of No, the fat fuck decided to betray us. How could you? Man named King Paps of man whose name carries so much gravitas. Anyway, so basically she gets this $750,000 gold debit card. It's like the bat card, never leave home without it, or never leave the cave without it. Fuck that up. Then they they just decide to blow shit up and just you know start over, basically. They end up sending people off the buildings. They're running these vehicles through all these other vehicles, blowing shit up. Launching missiles from a rocket bike that Barb apparently has and launching missiles from this one giant vehicle that was straight out of the Dawn of the Dead remake that hadn't happened yet, so I don't know why I referred that. Like the thing where they had the chainsaws and they did this and then the one girl got chainsawed because everybody's really stupid at the end of Dawn of the Dead. Anyway, so yeah, then Barb gets sandwiched by some guy uh, with a forklift <clears throat> on her bike and a car and then... Axel's like, I need to save my ex that actually may hate me, may love me, whatever. So I get this guy on a hook and carry him up. And now they're all floating and everything and doing this and hanging over the harbor. And then they send the villain to his doom. Who's the villain's name? I don't care. Does it really matter? I'm amazed I remembered any of these goddamn names. I remember, I'm amazed I remember to write any of this shit down. So they get to the airport, and then everybody gets on the goddamn plane, except Barb. She's going to take that $750,000 gold debit card and go to Paris. That apparently is fine. And I guess her and Willis are okay with each other. And that's it. That's it for Barb Wire. That was it. That was a that was a tour through hysteria that was not very good. A movie that should have been a lot more fun than it was, but hey, Pamela Anderson's tits. Am I right, lads? And ladies. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ripplin. I'll see you soon.